Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Housing Worth Los Angeles. My name is Alexander Barrera. I'm the events manager here. Today's panel, Bonnie Johnson writes the page to screen column for the Los Angeles Times. Times. Bonnie's work also appears in The Guardian, The New York Times, Los Angeles Review of Books, The Believer, on NPR, and elsewhere. So without further ado, Bonnie Johnson. Thank you um, to both Hauser and Worth and LA Review of Books for organizing the event. And thank you to my colleagues for joining me here on the panel today. Um, I'll go ahead and quickly introduce everyone. Here we have Claire Lundberg who founded CTL Scouting in Paris in 2011 after working for 10 years in New York film and theater. CTL Scouting is an international film and television scouting firm now with offices in London, New York, Los Angeles, and Seattle. Current clients include Netflix UK of The Crown and Sex Education, working title films of Baby Driver and Bridget Jones Diary, A24 Studios of Lady Bird, Moonlight, and Midsommar, Sony Pictures Television of Breaking Bad and The Good Doctor, HBO drama series Game of Thrones and Succession, and several other US and international film and television companies. Previously, Claire worked as a development executive for Scott Rudin and ran MGM's New York Literary Office. She began her career in theater as a director and producer. She holds an MFA from the Yale School of Drama and a BA in English from Yale College. Thanks for joining us, Claire. Sarah Libri has written for shows including Minx on HBO Max, Blind Spotting on Stars, Made for Love on HBO Max, and the Beauty and the Beast prequel series on Disney Plus, as well as Love Victor on Hulu. Her memoir, The Anatomy Book, is forthcoming from HarperCollins. Thomas Perry is the author of 29 novels, including the Butcher's Boy series and the Jane Whitefield series, a television show starring Jeff Bridges, John Lithgow, and Amy Redman, based on his 2017 novel, The Old Man, is currently on FX and Hulu. And Annie Julia Wyman is the co-creator of Netflix's The Chair and has written for HBO Max's Tokyo Vice and Hulu's Welcome to Chippendales. She has developed originals for the executive producers of Game of Thrones, Mrs. America, Reservation Dogs, Dickinson, and many more. Dr. Wyman earned her PhD in English literature from Harvard and is currently adapting a 19th century novel for FX. Okay, now I mentioned a bit about everyone's work and then a couple of cases, your backgrounds, but I'd like to discuss that in a little bit more detail because adaptations are by their nature an interdisciplinary project. Um, Annie and Tom both came from academia with PhDs in English literature. Sarah and Claire both came from theater and performing arts. I'm curious to hear a little bit about how you landed where you are doing your current jobs. We can go popcorn style or one at a time. <laughs> I thought I was going to get out of my turn. <laughs> oh, rats. Uh, the real short answer is that I needed money. Um, <laughs> academia is not as robust as it used to be as a, as a labor market, frankly. Um, I hate saying this sentence, but if, if you've seen my show, if you've seen the chair, you know that that's very true. Um, the wonderful institutions that I went through while I was getting my education, um, they just can't support new PhDs. Um, so I was very lucky. I was five years into a seven-year PhD, and I was looking for something else to do, and a friend took me out to dinner and said, you know, um, since I've seen you last, I've become a movie producer, and would you like to write a script for me? Um, it was truly one of these sort of lightning strike lucky chances. Um, to my credit, I immediately said no because I was embarrassed uh, and had never thought of myself really and truly as the kind of creative person I would have to become to write for the screen. Um, I said no, but I was so flattered that I went home and I bought some screenwriting software and I gave it a, a shot. The first thing I ever wrote was an adaptation of A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, how thrilling. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I got into the business. Um, let's see, my start, I think, came when I was, I was a TA 
teaching freshman English at the University of Rochester. And uh, I was one of the very first people after um, uh, videotaping things became possible and universities could afford to tape every young teacher in the classroom and, and so on. And I, I watched my, myself teaching a freshman English class and I, uh, I just said to myself, God, you know, you're awful. Um, <laughs> you better find something else to do with your life because this isn't going to work out. And uh, so I, I sort of, you know, went through the usual thing of getting jobs in universities and uh, right after I got my PhD, I spent a year as a commercial fisherman off Santa Barbara, um, running the boat while the diver was down getting abalone. And, uh, you know, that was, that was sort of good because it kind of gave me the first fresh air I'd breathed in about 20 years. And, uh, you know, so I went on and, and through universities for a while and uh, moved to Los Angeles. And at a certain point, uh, I got a phone call when I was in my office at USC and there was, I was meeting with a bunch of people, and uh, there was a guy on the other end, his name was Jim Corris, and he was uh, the director of current programming and marketing at Universal. And he said, I've read a couple of your books, and uh, you know, I think you could write television if you wanted to, and if you, if you don't like it, you, know, you can just go back to your old job, just, you know, let's come in and talk. And I said, you know, Sorry, I mean, I've got all these people in, the, in my office, and I'm, I'm busy now, and, and uh, you know, but I don't know anything about writing scripts or anything like that. I've never even seen one. So um, he said, well, I'll call you tomorrow. Just, you know, think about it. So what I did was I, I walked down the hallway to my wife's office, and I told her about it, and I said, what do you think? And that was my way of thinking. And um, <laughs> it sort of continues to be 42 years later. Um, but she said, yeah, why don't you give it a try, and if you run into trouble, I'll help you. And uh, she worked in a different program at the time than I, than I did. And uh, uh, what happened was I did try to write a script. I did get into trouble, and she did help me. And we wrote television together as partners for the next 11 years. So, you know, that was sort of an interesting... <laughs> kind of way to get into it. It's completely passive, and in a way, I've sort of followed that all the way through my, uh, my career. I've just sort of uh, maintained the lowest possible expectations and been pleasantly surprised a lot of times. So. And Tom Wife's Joe, Tom's wife, Joe, is here today as well, co-screenwriter. Co there she is. Um, OK. Uh, similarly, I kind of was, I have an MFA in fiction, and my whole MO for 10 years was I'll just write fiction in the morning, and then I'll have a terrible office job, and that's just what I'll do until I die. <laughs> um, and then I had a friend whose husband was an agent, and she was like, you know, there is a better way. Like, you could probably write a pilot and not have to have a job that you hate. And... Um, my husband's a filmmaker, and his manager was always kind of like, yeah, if you write a pilot, I'll see if I can get you staffed. And it, I wrote a pilot that was based on a novel that I'd written, got some meetings off it, got staffed, and was really sort of like, okay, but what about my novel? What about like my literary career? And, and a close friend who was a novelist, Katya Kana, uh, was like, just ride the wave. Just see what happens. Just, you know, just take the meetings. Just do the job. And... Um, yeah, for five years later, here I am. It worked out. <laughs> we have some things in common here. Annie and I went to Stanford together for undergrad, and Tom and I were both commercial fishermen. <laughs> I know that Sarah and I both love opera. Um, I didn't even know that what I do right now was a job, actually, when I got out of school. Um, I grew up in California, but wanted to be an actor and wanted to get to New York really badly. And I studied acting and directing. And then, not unlike Annie, I was very, very poor. And I was living in New York. And I just thought, maybe I can do something that is a smaller part of a larger artistic endeavor. So I started working in film development for Robert De Niro's company, Tribeca. And then I did that for a few years. I worked for Scott Rudin, also a big producer in New York. And I didn't really want to move to Los Angeles. 
And so a friend of mine said, why don't you try book scouting, which I didn't know was a job, um, because it's a way to stay in New York but still work for the big studios in Los Angeles and be connected to that industry. Um, and I ended up really loving it. I'd always been a big reader as a kid, and it's a nice fusion of getting to read, but also getting to imagine what something could be uh, in adaptation. Um, and then my company basically grew just uh, also serendipitously. I ended up moving to France because my husband got a job there. And it was right about the time that streaming started to become more international. And the experience that I'd had as somebody who'd worked with companies that were sort of big US Hollywood companies were interesting to people in Europe and vice versa. And so my company has sort of grown not only scouting IP, but also helping different you know, industries talk to one another, if it's France trying to option a book in America or things like that. And I find that part very interesting as well. Great, well that's actually perfect for my next question um, because Claire, many of us hear from the literary side of things. So I'm hoping you can explain to us as a scout how you advise studios and producers on the IP market and how you help manage those deals. I explain it all, all at once. <laughs> My entire job. Um, uh, I mean, it's it's multifaceted. I think a lot of it is, you know, um, I don't know. I often say to my clients that scouting is sort of a breadth versus depth problem because what you what you are on the one hand is kind of a market advisor and analyst, so you're trying to look at the entire publishing or increasingly IP market and let people know what's selling. And I mean, they're basically like, though I do a lot of international work offices that I have are in the chief English language IP centers, LA, New York, London. So you're trying to give them an idea of like what the hottest thing is there for books, but then also trying to look at left field contenders for things that might be of quality, whether that's book talk or, you know, girl with the dragon tattoo coming out of Sweden or something like that. But then at the same time, while you're trying to, so what we do is sort of reportage on the whole market and what's selling, but then also you have to be uh, specific to the brand of the client. You know, like Working Title, who I work for, is going to be looking for slightly different things than A24, than HBO, and sometimes there's overlap, but you know, for the most part you want to think for the clients, you know, what is it that means you have to do this piece? What are your specific contacts or talents? Or talent relationships that would make you the best argument for this. So that's like a tiny piece of it, but hopefully it gives you some idea. I think that's helpful. Um, and now, Tom, I know that you've been on the authorial side of those deals many, many times as your work has often been optioned. And for whatever reasons, The Old Man is the first work to actually be produced for the screen, I believe. So. Um, I would be curious to hear what your experience has been like having your work optioned in general and then also having one of the books produced for TV. Um, it's been a sort of strange, a long strange trip as the, <laughs> the Grateful Dead <laughs> used to say. But um, what, what happened was my very first novel, The Butcher's Boy, which was published in 1982, was optioned before it actually came out. Um, and it remained an option continuously for 19 years, changing hands occasionally. Um, companies went out of business that had optioned it. Other companies rose. People were born, grew up, <laughs> uh, had perfectly good careers, and you know, which they allowed to crash to the ground, things like that. All this stuff happened. People kept saying once a year someone would say happy birthday to me. And uh, more and more often, that seemed to come more and more often as the years went by. Um, an awful lot of things do get optioned. And what happens, I realized at a certain point that there are several things going on that, that have you know, given me a problem. One is um, that the novels that I write um, tend to involve people who are um, a, just a slight bit shady, like they do things like kill people for a living and stuff like that. Um, so there are an awful lot of conversations in which two people are talking and 
both of them are lying and at least one of them is using a false name. This is a problem for a screenwriter, as anybody can tell you. It's, you know, it's very hard to follow some of these things if you don't have a page right in front of you telling you exactly what's going on. So there were a lot of people who had you know, optioned uh, things with the uh, legitimate idea of making a good movie and um, I think got kind of lost. You know? So at a, a certain point, uh, they, their enthusiasm fades and then a couple of years later somebody else you know, comes along and there's another wave of bogus enthusiasm and I option the book again, whatever it is, and um, you know, the same process occurs. So this has gone on for over 40 years now and it's finally in the case of um, the old man, uh, it, uh, it survived an incredible amount of weird and awful bad luck, including things like, you know, they were in uh, Morocco building sets for the seventh through tenth episodes when COVID came, and uh, they had to get out and decided that, you know, they had to do uh, make sets here for other <laughs> other parts of the <coughs> of the series. Um, Jeff Bridges who was going to be the title character, the old man, um, was working on episode five when he suddenly you know, had a pain and, dis and went to the doctor and discovered that he had lymphoma. Um, and so he was you know, really sort of hovering between life and death for a while. And because he was taking chemo, he got COVID at the chemo you know, place because he had no no resistance when you take, uh, you know, when you're, you're under treatment for cancer, you're terribly vulnerable. So he had a terrible lingering case of, of COVID. All this terrible stuff was going on, and everybody, I think, just stopped caring whether the this series was ever going to be made. They just cared about whether this wonderful man was going to survive, because he really is a wonderful man. I mean, he's a, he's a sort of moral force. And, um, you know, eventually he got better. And when he did, they um, began filming again and finished it. And 95% of the people who had worked on it at the beginning came back to work on it again, largely because of how, you know, what a happy set it had been and how uh, thoroughly decent the people who were making it were. And um, I do also have to say uh, that, you know, my role in this really kind of ended five years ago when I wrote the book. And they optioned it. Um, you know, the scripts and and uh, so on were uh, were done by other people. And the uh, you know, I, I went to the set a couple of times to meet the actors and see what they were doing and stuff. And they were very nice to me. But uh, I I noticed that the last time anybody asked me any advice about a a television show was I I believe I was 40. Uh, in uh, in a week I'm going to be 75. So. Uh, you get the idea. <laughs> um, <clears throat> basically what you do is you, you do your own work and hope that somebody likes it. Um, you know, a reader, possibly a producer, possibly, you know, someone uh, that you, you know, or whatever, you feel good about it. But really, um, you know, my life is being a novelist. Um, you know, even though I had written television for a while, it was uh, eons ago. So. Um, I know, Sarah, for your pilot, you optioned the novel and Claire as a scout, you find and select material in general. I'm curious how you've chosen the books and whether you see studio demand for any particular kind of IP lately. And that's intellectual property. Um, I think I'm, since I'm on the writer side, it's probably really different from being on the seller side. Or is that? Is that? Is that how you would characterize yourself? Well, I'm a consultant, yeah. but, uh, but, I, but I mostly consult for buyers. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah, so people that are producing or uh, distributing. Yeah, so I'm working with Working Title on this project, and they came to me with this book that I don't think I'm allowed to say the title of yet, but um, that was totally based on the fact that, like, in my sample and everything I've written is, like, sort of sex comedies with immoral female characters at the center, morally compromised in some way. So those are, I, I mean, that's sort of like the niche that I found myself in as a writer. So 
they brought this book to me and they were like, do you want to do this? And I was like, hell yeah, like it had everything I wanted. So it was less that I got to choose it. It was more that they had it set up and they brought it to me. Mm -hmm. I think mm, for me, uh, it sort of goes back to what I was saying before. I mean, it depends also like if you want to make a feature or a television show and sometimes I mean, again, we've just gone through this explosion of television. My experience prior to the last like five years was really in, or maybe six or seven years, was really in feature scouting. We all remember the time when it wasn't Netflix or Amazon that were sort of ruling the town, but it was like Warner Brothers and Paramount. And then you were really trying to buy like two hour tentpole movies. And that was a much more limited scope of things that you could buy from books specifically. Mm -hmm. um, I often say it was either you're either buying The Born Identity, Jurassic Park, Harry Potter, or maybe like Devil Wears Prada, if you were very lucky. But there wasn't, now we see so much more stuff. But at the same time, a lot of times, the conversation gets a little bit blurry. Sometimes a book really is best suited to a TV series because uh, it's longer. <laughs> Books are long, it's hard to fit them into two hours and have them feel authentic. But sometimes a book has an ending, and uh, often when you're talking, I mean, books do have endings, but like if it's not a series, the book needs to have an engine at the center of it to really organically turn into more than just a limited series. Quite often, the profit motive of a television series is to do more than just a limited series, as you will have seen from things like Big Little Lies, which started as one series, but then all of a sudden became two series because it had done so well as one series. So the creative question of like how the book would best be adapted often runs up against the economic realities of wherever the market is at that time. And I think, you know, I sort of live in that space and try to give people uh, an idea of like, you know, in its best form, it would be this, but could it be this other thing? Sure, but you'd have to do X or Y to it. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm curious in general about the choice of formats. Um, Annie, you created the chair specifically for TV. Did you ever consider making it a film or even a book, or was it always TV, and why is that? And then for either current TV writer, Annie or Sarah, um, I'd love to hear more from your side about how a single book, like Made for Love or Tokyo Vice, uh, or even The Old Man, as we've learned, becomes a second season of TV after the original story ends. Yeah, uh, the chair was always going to be television because I was very lucky to be working with the two most successful television showrunners of all time. It was like Dan Weiss and David Benioff make TV, so let's make some TV, <laughs> you know? Um, I will say the question is interesting to me because we did think of that series as a long movie, which sometimes when television writers are tasked with doing a limited, right, you think, okay, I'm going to break this narrative structure, you know, break like, um, select all my story beats based on the idea that the thing will run forever. Or you can find another model. In our case, it was the 90s rom-com, in fact, um, and how can we make like something like broadcast news that is really fun, you know, sort of smuggle that into a television format. Um, yeah, so there's a funny way in which there's adaptation as we know it, right? The story on the page gets transformed so it fits into the television container that you've been given. Or there's this kind of sneaky writerly stuff that's like, I any form that I'm excited about, I'm gonna see if I can borrow from and get it into this other shape. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the thing that most surprised me about working on TV adaptations of books is that the two processes are so completely divorced from each other. It's like the novelist was in the room for Made for Love, Alyssa Nutting, she's amazing, she's incredible, but just because it was her book, the show was a totally different thing, and the showrunner was the one who pitched that show, basically created it. Like, she would have to pitch like every other staff writer in the room. Um, and then in the second season, it's drawn from the book. There was some staff shakeups, so she, I think, had a little bit more control over that. But it was the, it was still like just because it was her book didn't have anything to do with what was happening on screen. And 
yeah, I think also that some really great advice I got from a showrunner on Made for Love was if you are pitching an adaptation of a book, you know, break the book. Don't feel like you need to like do a line by line reinterpretation of the book for screen. You can do whatever you want, whatever you feel like you as a writer can write. And that has been super helpful for me in pitching books and adapting books. Yeah, I'd like to agree with that, that, you know, there have been, I've gotten some letters from uh, loyal fans who have, have, you know, expressed some dismay that the, you know, there is a, a lot of, of distance between the original book and the, the uh, episodes of the series. And, you know, I, I sort of had to explain, you know, that um, these guys who are very talented, um, John Steinberg and Robert Levine, um, and who have done other series and so on, they were hired not to make the most faithful rendition in a sort of audio-visual format of my novel. They were hired to make the best TV show and most entertaining TV show that they possibly could. And they used a lot of different resources, only one of which was my book. You know, the, the characters come from my book. Uh, many of the things that happen to them do not. <laughs> And in the second season, which, you know, it's, it's just been picked up for a second season, uh, as far as I can tell, that's going to be all that's, that remains from the book at this, you know, that, that second season. And I'm going to watch it with interest to see what happens to, these, to this character. So. That's great. And I'm curious, Tom, because you do have experience writing original material for a TV detective series along with Joe, your wife whether you considered adapting your own books to either film or TV, what you think the advantages or disadvantages of that would be. And I know Sarah also has a forthcoming book. Curious whether you might have plans to adapt that either yourself or with an option. Uh, I did consider it um, for about five minutes. And then I realized that when I am done with, with a book, I'm really done with it. I've lived with it for a year, and I, every single plot point or every single thing about these characters was decided from among all the entire matrix of possible things. That is, I've made all the right decisions for a novel. Um, and the, the notion of, of you know going into, into what I remember about the the world of television and spending all your time arguing for the decision that you made years ago when you wrote this book just seemed like insanity. I mean, it's, you know, I'm sure it's lucrative, but, um, you know, there are other ways to make money and how much money do you need? <laughs> so, uh, I, the very best decision for me is really to simply be a novelist, period. Yeah, I mean, I, like I, like I said, like the two processes are so divorced from each other. Like writing a book is such a solitary process and you're in charge of everything. And then TV and film are so collaborative. You're writing for actors, you're writing for directors. You have to get all kinds of, you know, production studios, networks, everybody on board. So you are kind of creating a commercial product and that like the financial stakes are so much higher. So if, like my book, for example, like that's gonna come out and that'll be in a form that was written to be a book. And if I adapt it or, you know, option or sell it, like that's gonna be a different project that I'm starting at zero, you know, and that's, I will be working with lots of other people and I have to sell it as something that like people would want to watch as opposed to read. So it's like, it's just two completely different sides of your brain. Um, Turning more to that question of market for a moment, um, Annie, you've mentioned to me that the potential sale of film and TV rights may be changing the way that fiction and nonfiction writers approach their work and the way that magazines and newspapers function. And Claire, you've mentioned to me that publishers in general and indie presses in particular might be able to use a film or TV option to market their authors. I'm wondering if you both can say more about the role uh, that potential for adaptation plays in publishing. I will say, uh, 
you know, things have happened to me in my brief career that have sort of have made me raise my eyebrows, you know, specifically touching intellectual property because so much of what you watch is, is based on something or other, right? So, you know, I take meetings now and I have an idea and uh, that idea will be met with en enthusiasm, whether classic bogus enthusiasm or a real enthusiasm, but then the suggestion will be, okay, like let's take that and make a podcast and then let's sell the rights to the podcast for TV. So it, it's like, well, why don't we just make a TV show, right? This extra little beat in the process because, and I would absolutely defer to Claire and be in fact very professionally interested in what you have to say about this. Um, there is this sort of new set of things happening where you wanna make IP and then sell the IP as opposed to taking what would seem to be a much more direct road. Um, I know too there are whole like long form publications like The Atavist I guess which shuttered recently but the business model was built on selling the rights to these long form pieces of journalism to film and television. Um, so yeah, I, I do think, oh yeah, and also any idea you have that is particularly good, if you say, oh no, it's not based on anything, it's just my, you know, uh, potent imagination, <laughs> you get this disappointed look that's like, oh, <laughs> well, never mind. <laughs> so just so. make something up. Yeah. <laughs> I, think there, I think there are two different questions. One is about that, you know, what is a book and what is IP? Right. Um, and the other one is about what presses can do or how, if it's affecting what people buy. I think on the first one, uh, I feel like it's a knock-on effect, what you're experiencing, of the change. Hollywood's always going through changes. This is ours is streaming at the moment, but there are always changes um, every generation, and I think to a degree, there's been an enormous uh, change in the way that TV is monetized. We don't have ads quite in the same way, and there isn't syndication in the same way. You remember when you used to be excited that like Seinfeld would get to 100 episodes, and then, I mean, I don't know, maybe this isn't relevant to you, but like TV shows would be like, 100 episodes, now we will run forever, somewhere in the world, and we will always be paid, and that doesn't really happen anymore because the streaming entities, uh, and not just, I mean, everybody's got a streaming entity, Disney has one, you know, are gonna buy the rights up front, and you're not gonna have the same residual payment that you would always have. And that has made the people that are brokering these deals, agents, managers, try to think of ways to take the IP that their clients are bringing them, the ideas, and say, well, maybe it's not just a book, maybe it's a universe you know, that we can monetize across many things. And so I think that's, you feel that pressure in the market right now to say like, is Downton Abbey a universe? Maybe it's a universe, you know, like, and um, I think that's interesting actually, but it does mean that like, if you are saying to yourself, maybe I just want to write a novel, your reps may put pressure on you to do more than that because it will give them more revenue streams. Um, on the other side of things, I do think that, you know, you brought up in the in our this is a fair for indie presses and we're talking about indie books that have done very well and a good example of that is Sally Rooney's books published by Faber admittedly an enormous indie one of the oldest ones with a very strong brand but those books are a huge part of its current ability to sustain itself and those books were bestsellers prior to the TV series but that will only increase the amount of people that are available to watch those books. Uh, I mean, to buy those, like, they'll see the series and then they'll buy the books and it will just, you know, it does affect the bottom line of the publishers. Uh, at the same time that the publishers don't necessarily, like the publishers aren't responsible for the option of the book. That's on the author and the agent side of things. The publishers are only seeing money from them in these sales that continue. Anyway, sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> No, this is, I think, fascinating to a lot of us. And since we are here this weekend to celebrate um, indie publishing and indie booksellers in particular, I do want to name a handful of um, indie books with major adaptations in the last few years that have been very successful. There's Grove, which published Pulitzer Prize winner The Sympathizer by Via Tan Nguyen, who's local, which he adapted for a forthcoming HBO series. 
Um, as Claire mentioned, there's the British Indie Faber, which has Sally Rooney's books. There's Oni Press, which published the Stump Stumptown graphic novel series by Greg Rocca on ABC. Abrams, which published Christine Lunan's Caging Skies, which was adapted into Jojo Rabbit, which was nominated for an Oscar. There's the Canadian indie House of a Nancy, which published Patrick DeWitt's French Exit, which he adapted to the Golden Globe nominated uh, film on Sony Pictures Classics. Drawn in Quarterly, another uh, graphic novel publisher, which publishes Adrian Tamine's books, stories from multiple of which were um, adapted into the film Paris 13th District, which premiered at Cannes. There's the Bloomsbury book, Women Talking by Miriam Toes, which has a forthcoming adaptation with Frances McDormand. And considering all of these success stories, um, a further question on this subject for Claire in particular, there's currently so much media conglomeration and studio thirst for material. And I know that studios are forming increasingly close relationships with big five publishers. I recently interviewed Elizabeth Gabler from Sony 3000 Pictures. Um, she formerly led the Fox 2000 label, which is focused mainly on literary sources. And her new label, 3000, is actually jointly financed by Sony and HarperCollins, which is a first. Um, and Gabler told me that she got to know the Harper executives when they were all working together under Rupert Murdoch's um, News Corp umbrella. So I wouldn't be surprised if other studios try to follow her lead if they can at some point. I'm wondering if there is a danger of these arrangements squeezing out the work of indie presses and their authors for the adaptation market, and I'm wondering if so, if there's a way to push back. I'm less worried about this because I think the Elizabeth Gabler deal is a particular deal that we don't know if it's going to work because at the end of the day, what they are banking on, I think, is that she's going to make something, like she made The Devil Wears Prada and things like that at Fox 2000, that will increase their book sales. And we don't really, they don't own the, op like they, to a degree, that relationship is one where she gets an early look at some things that are on the editorial meeting list. And she does have a long relationship with HarperCollins because of Fox previously. But, uh, you know, they still, they bought this trilogy, Don Winslow's book, City of Fire, uh, they were able to buy that early because he's a HarperCollins author, uh, but they still had to pay Don Winslow and his agents $5 million for that. It's not like they're getting a bargain necessarily. So I, I, I don't really know. I actually only have good news for indie presses because I feel like the publishing world, especially during COVID, had this kind of flight to, we're going to just buy things we recognize. Like we're going to buy Stephen King because we liked Stephen, Stephen King before, you know? Uh, we're gonna buy 1984 because we wanna know what's going on with politics and know about that book. But the, um, the television world is just open to way more stories. I often say that like I can't find some stories that are my clients want because big five publishers are too conservative to buy them because they don't see who the readership is. So I actually think indie presses have like only, only, only positive things can happen there. <laughs> That's great to hear. Um, and on that same subject, Tom, the old man came out on Mysterious Press, which is an indie. I know you actually started your career on major presses and then moved to an indie, and you told me that had to do with your relationship with your editor in particular and his independent bookstore. Can you tell us more about that? Oh, yeah. Um, my editor is Otto Penzler. Otto uh, founded the Mysterious Press sometime in the, I believe, 1970s or so. And uh, he, was, he started out as a bookstore owner. He owned a bookstore on 56th Street in New York, which was this great place where you'd go in and you'd see all the books on the bottom floor. And then there was a like a sort of circular staircase that went up to this attic that he had where there was just his office and his books which were, you know, when you would go to sign books at the bookstore, you would go up and sit in Otto's office and talk to him, his office being like the size of this, <laughs> of this uh, concrete uh, <laughs> place here. And the, you know, books were, would, if you would sign the book, it would then go up on those shelves, you know. 
and uh, Otto, um, you know, ran it as an independent for a little while, and it had uh, all kinds of people like Donald Westlake and others were his uh, the, uh, his authors. And then he started to, at a certain point, kind of connect Mysterious Press to other publishers, larger publishers. Um, when I, uh, you know, at a certain point, I, I became sort of tired of Random House. And, um, you know, they had published, I guess, my first 10 books or so. And um, I didn't like the editorial process. I didn't like the, um, <laughs> essentially, the fact that they had this enormous apparatus, but it never seemed to get rolled out for me, for my books. In other words, uh, you know, it was great for a, an, somebody who was obviously going to be an instant bestseller. They would spend a lot more money on it than they would on me, you know, because I was kind of going along happily writing my books. I wasn't even paying much attention to that stuff for a long time. And then at a certain point, Otto um, moved his press to, um, what was it, Harcourt. And um, he said to me, basically, you know, <clears throat> um, how would you like to come to, um, you know, my, <laughs> essentially, my publishing house? And, you know, I will give you special attention and watch, you know, take very care, good care of your books and edit them gently and you can have, you know, whatever they would have paid you to go around the country to sell books, I will, I will meet that and, uh, and so on. And, and I started having uh, the pleasure of having Otto edit my books. And Otto understands, you know, one of the things that people say about Otto Penzler, I remember Robert B. Parker at one point said, you know, the reason people were interested in working with Otto Penzler is that he knows more about mystery fiction than most people know about anything. And it's still true. You know, if you talk to Otto about a 40-year-old mystery book that you picked up somewhere, he'll tell you, you know, it's a great book, but on page 248, you know, he makes a terrible mistake. And it's just a shame. It's a terrible shame. And, you know, and Otto, Otto uh, you know, is, is a great editor, just a wonderful editor. And then at a certain point, he decided he wanted to, um, oh, actually, Houghton Mifflin bought Harcourt at that point. And uh, he said, well, will you, you know, will you go along and, uh, <clears throat> and remain, you know, in my service? And, and, and I said, you know, Otto, um, I want the best editor. I don't want the 80th best editor. So, yeah, I will. And you know he's continued to be a terrific editor, and uh, you know we're both getting up in years now, and he's now hiring uh, Louisa Smith, who's the daughter of Martin Cruz Smith, to run uh, Mysterious Press. She's going to be the president, and, and uh, he's going to step back and be, you know, merely the owner and so on. But he's still editing my books. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> You know, it's it's a it's a great thing. I mean, I've really it's it's been a terrific thing for me, and I've I think my writing has actually, um, contrary to the usual story about writers, um, as I've gotten older, they've gotten better rather than worse, which you know is obviously a pattern that's not going to continue forever. <laughs> but uh, it's been a it's been good for me, and so I I was happy with that, and I don't uh, you know I don't miss being with big publishers. Okay, well, we have just a little time left here, so I think we're actually going to take questions from the audience. And if you don't have a question, you can tell us what's your favorite adaptation and why. Hi. Can you hear me well? Hi, my name is Christina, and first of all, I just want to congratulate this for this whole event because I am a mother of three um, creative um, young man, one of them is here, and he's probably going to hate me for <laughs> mentioning. And uh, I'm a big fan. I love to read, and my husband and I, big, you know, writers too. Sometimes, like for fun, and um, so I'm thinking. There, I hear what I hear. There's just so much opportunity now, right on TV, and I would also say because there is such a it's such a shift right in, in humanity with everything going on it's it seems to me like with the humanity and global change and 
political issues with democracy, whatever, I feel among a lot of people that there is a search for more meaning, going deeper in certain subjects, and, and, and the book and TV has blossomed in many ways, in my opinion, for that too, during this last, during the COVID. So my question is, since I deal with a lot of young men, one of my sons, for instance, is at USC in School of Dramatic Arts this year, so I've been participating in a lot of stuff there in the art, in the area of dramatic arts. So what advice, and I know you're probably tired of listening to this question, but I'm going to ask anyway. What advice you would give to a young college student that loves to write, loves to, you know, perform and watch movies, and and you know, and still believes that he can or she can sell his story, his characters, not necessarily look for something that will become a big whatever movie or series, you know what I'm saying? What, 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 what advice would you give to that young person? Thank you. I love these questions because I'm a former professor. This was like my bread and butter. Um, if the work is good, anything is possible, but you have to focus on the work being good first. That's always my answer for that one. Absolutely true. <laughs> that's, you know, that's it. I mean, I, uh, a lady I know who shall be nameless, um, who owns a bookstore um, at a certain point, had a very, very successful writer come to her store and with his uh, publisher's representative and his agent and a couple of other people. And, you know, he was there to sign books. And, uh, and he said, I bet I'm your, your most popular writer, right? And uh, she said, well, no, actually, you're not. Um, <laughs> at that time, um, I, oh, I, I forget who it was. He, she said, well, you know, this is, he's the most popular writer. He said, well, what can I do to become the most popular writer in your bookstore? And she said, write better books. And, <laughs> and that's really the answer to everything. That's it. That's all there is. That's all anybody wants from you. That's all that, you know, you can give them. It's just do your best work. I would say that all of my opportunities came through my friends. It's just like knowing, like, I when I moved out to LA, I got a job as an assistant at William Morris Endeavor, which is a big three agency, because I had a friend who was leaving that job and set me up with an interview. And then, you know, all of my best friends, I met my husband through a friend I met, like working at that agency on my very first day there. You know, I wrote my pilot because my friend whose husband is an agent was somebody that I worked with at WME when I started, you know, like I got, and he sort of helped me meet my reps, like all of it. My, I met my husband. Yeah. Like everybody through, um, being an assistant in LA. So like those assistant jobs are amazing springboards. Um, keeping in touch with people, like saying yes to opportunities. I kept my expenses very low so that I could do creative projects for no money for years. It's just sort of, that's sort of the practical advice I would, I would give, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna say a slightly different thing, which is try a lot of different things. Because you're very young, and like I've gone from being an actor, to being a director, to being a development executive, to being, you know, a book scout. And I really like what I'm doing right now. But I think if I had held on really tightly to any of the earlier things, you know, uh, just be ready to, you know, have another creative endeavor that makes you happy that, and let it surprise you, you know? I agree. Okay, the question was, um, if you're a novelist querying agents, how was that process? Okay. Did you have, like, I know sometimes people go through 100 queries and rejections and they keep trying, or if you didn't hear from anyone, did you go back and rewrite those first 10 pages of your novel? Or, yeah. I don't think anybody can ever tell you more than what their personal experience is, but I found that one of the things that, I, that is, has always worked for me and always made things happen is I don't even talk to anybody until I have a book finished, hand you the book. This is it. You don't have to trust me that the rest of it's going to be better or good or that I'll rewrite any of it or whatever. 
you know, here's the book. Will you represent me? And I started out with a, a writing to, uh, well, what happened was actually I read a, a news, a, 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 an article in um, a magazine, I forget which one it was, it may have been The Atlantic, it was something. And it, the purpose of the book said, uh, or this um, article was, was to convince us that it was almost impossible to get a book published. And so what this guy had done was he took <coughs> the, um, the last National Book Award winner, which was um, by a professor at Stanford, and he typed out the first hundred pages, put his own name on it, and sent it into um, publishers. Sent it to you know basically the whole list of publishers that existed at the time, and he got all these polite answers, and not one of them was interested, and not one of them wanted to publish the book. So he printed that article. Um, the next month, there were a whole bunch of uh, articles or uh, letters from publishers saying, you know, that's not fair. That's not how we work. You know, you can't say that you're going to, that just because we didn't select something over the transom, that we're not, you know, serious about this business. Um, you know, we bought ordinary people <laughs> that way. Um, so what he did was he then um, wrote to the uh, um, Authors Guild and got a little blue booklet of all of the um, agents that uh, essentially existed in, in at that time New York really was the only place and uh, he sent his hundred page selection of the last year's National Book Award winner to them and not one of them recognized it and not one of them was interested and uh, you know what it did for me though was it told me that there was this little blue book that you could get by writing to <laughs> the Authors Guild in New York and that would list all of these agents. So I started writing letters to them and it was, it, you know, what I did was I wrote a letter and it would be, um, you know, I have this book, would you like to read this book? And here's the synopsis, you know, one page synopsis. Um, fortunately, the first person who answered me was a person whose name began with B. <laughs> There's an elderly agent named Lurton Blassingame in New York, and uh, believe it or not, I feel I'm sort of ashamed that I didn't make up that name, but it's just, um, and uh, he said, um, who are you? That was his letter. It takes, you know, these are in the old days when you had to actually send letters. Who are you? You know, tell me. And I, I wrote him back saying who I was, which was basically nobody. I'm nobody. My name is Thomas Perry. And he said, uh, well, send the manuscript, I'll read it. And you have to realize that it takes like two weeks for each of these answers to go back and forth. <clears throat> and so I sent him the manuscript, he wrote me another single line letter and he said, I like it, I'll, uh, I'll try to sell it. And, and the, the next week he did to Suzanne Kirk, who was the, um, the sort of mystery person at, uh, at that time Scribner's. And at that time, Scribner's was still owned by the Scribner family. So, it was, you know, it was essentially a very small place, but that's what happened. In other words, um, all you can do is have a book or have a something or other and, and keep trying, keep asking. Will you read it? Will you look at it? Somebody will like it if it's good. If it's not, write another one. You know, it's, you have to ask yourself in this business, um, you know, what will I do if I have a wonderful book that's really successful and everybody loves it in the world, you'll sit down and begin to write another one. What are you going to do if you send this thing everywhere and everybody hates it and every, nobody respects it and nobody wants, understands it even? What are you going to do? You'll sit down and start writing another one. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, what, the, that's what you're doing if you select, select that life. I think we might have time for one more question. Thank you. Hi, I had a question for Dr. Wyman. Um, I work on the buyer side. I work at HBO Max, and I was wondering if the reason why, or when you approach buyers and they tell you to turn it into a podcast or established IP, is that, um, is that because they want you to develop a fan base first, or because they want to have something to option, or I was just curious about what you said. Uh, I think it's the latter. They. And I, again, I would defer to Claire because she has more insight into this process than I, I do. Um, 
I think it's because they want something to option. It may also be because certain companies are trying to diversify, right? Oh, we were a TV company, but now we also have a podcast wing and we need to feed that wing something or other. So why not your cute little idea, you know? Um, yeah. I'm so curious also. Um, I want to ask you questions about HBO Max, but I, I won't. We'll, we'll gossip later. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't. I, I, is it a buyer that's asking you this, or is it a manager that's asking you to turn it into a, a buyer? Oh, a buyer who was like, Man, I would imagine. I mean, it's kind of interesting. It could be either. I agree with you. It could be like, we want. And this goes back and forth in my world from people who are like, we need to option a thing so that we know we have a thing, like a book or to base our adaptation on. Or one of my less favorite questions, why do we need the book for that? You know uh, what I mean? Like where people will be like, uh, we could just pay someone to write that idea. And my mm -hmm. answer is often, I'm a book scout, so I'm always going to tell you to option the book. But like, I think those, that dialogue is quite active. You know, whether you need the IP or, you know. Or the terrible question, does the author want to be involved? <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's, that question has gotten a lot, like, better. I feel like people have gotten a lot more flexible about that in, like, good ways, which yeah, I think is, is helpful. Yeah. But. Would you say, I'm sorry, now we're just talking inside just baseball. The two of us are talking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just women talking. Um, would you say more authors are interested in producer roles now, like being an EP or, I mean, maybe this is also a question for Tom, and I'm sorry, Bonnie, for stealing your panel right at the last second. No, please go ahead. <laughs> I, feel like, I, feel like what, I feel like what Tom said was correct. Like some people, like a lot of the conversations that I have with development execs are like, people are novelists, or journalists, or graphic artists, or whatever they are initially. That's what they wanted to do. That's what they created this for. And so can't necessarily make their desires the same as the desires for a TV writer. Right. Mm -hmm. And as long as you can acknowledge that like, that's a valid piece of, that's a valid ambition, a valid industry, an industry that has its own rules and profit motives and things like that, then you, know, you can have a conversation about it. But if you're constantly, like I've had development executives be like, couldn't we just come up with an idea and get a writer to write it, you know? And I'd just be like, no, like, I mean, you can get, I mean, the novelist to write the novel that we want to have be a book so we would have the IP, blah, blah. like you can, but it's never gonna be as good as somebody coming to it with their own kind of spark, mm -hmm. so. I think we're going to have to wrap up because there's another panel coming on after us. Yes, that is correct. Uh, everyone give it up to our uh, page to screen and in between panelists. Thank you, Sarah, Claire, Thomas, Annie, and Bonnie.